So like James said, I'm Irina. I'm going to be talking about microbial functional analysis for this lecture. So as a brief overview, I'll be talking about why perform functional classification, uh, gene-based classification, species pangenomes very briefly, metagenomic gene content, and then specifically about the program HUMAN3, which is short for HMP Unified Metabolic Analysis Network 3, which is the program that we'll be working with today, or we'll be working with the output of this program today because it's too big and bulky and takes too long to run to run the actual program. But it's a very simple and straightforward program to run because online they have really, really good documentation and you can basically just copy and paste from that website. So to start out, I do want to ask everybody what you work on to get an idea because functional profiling will work much better for some things than others. Um, particularly if you are working on samples that come from humans or mammals, it will work much better than if you are working on, for example, sediment samples. So I just want to get an idea of what everyone is working on. So is there any way that I could like get a list of the names and just go through? Um, is the participant the yeah. Okay, so I'll just go through the list and read your names. And if you could either, uh, yeah, I guess if you could speak, that would be great. Because uh, otherwise, I'd have to bounce back and forth between the list and the uh, message. So, okay, we'll start with Anon. What do you work on? Hey, um, can you hear me? Is this better now? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> my volume's always off. Can you hear it's me? It's all right. <laughs> So yeah, I work now, currently I work on dental calculus, metagenomes from dental calculus, but in the future on sediments. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Alice. Okay, wait, uh, working? Okay. Oh, you're uh, quite badly. Oh, okay, oh. maybe try again. Uh, yeah, my bandwidth is kind of terrible right now. Uh, is this better? A little bit. Uh, well, it'll be short. I'm mostly working on a project uh, comparing rockfish taxa uh, at the moment. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrea or Andrea? Can you hear me? Uh, actually, I'm currently working on uh, metagenomics of um, dental calculus. Thanks. Uh, Brooklyn? So, I just finished my undergraduate degree and I'm here for an internship, but the internship hasn't started yet and I'm not sure exactly what I'll be working on yet. All right. Thanks. Uh, Dario? Hi, uh, yes, I'm working in, in metagenomics with copper lights and pelvic sediments, and also with bones and teeth, pathological bones and teeth. Thanks. David? Is it me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm working uh, uh, ancient human uh, samples, both teeth and bones. Thanks. Uh, Emily? Hi. Um, I'm going to be working with uh, pathogens with a specific focus on Yersinia pastis. Thanks. Uh, eating? I work with medicinians from dental calculus and also from the and open. Can you hear that? Could you, yeah, could you maybe get closer to your computer? Uh, now that was a little bit. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I work on metagenomes in dental calculus and also in intracellular bacteria. Thanks. Uh, Ina? Uh, um, I work, I'm working on natural products from a dairy product. Thanks. Uh, Jamie? See, I guess we have one Jamie that says she, her. That would be the first one on the list. Yeah, Jamie and Jamie. Oh, Jamie. Jamie and Jaime. Okay. Oh, is it me or? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, I do uh, human dental calculus. Thanks. Uh, 
This one is Jaime. Is that... Maybe? No? Okay. Uh, then in my case, move on. Johnny? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, if, you still... can't, if, you can't, if you can't speak, just type in the chat. Yeah. So it looks like it's still connecting for Johnny. So if you want to type, then we'll just move on to the next one. So Kadri. Maybe not there. Okay. Carrie. Hi, um, I haven't started my PhD program yet, so things could change, but maybe dental calculus. Thanks. Uh, Laura? Hi. Um, I believe that I'm going to do uh, a little of all these things in human pathogens for colonial period in Mexico City. Thanks. Tony uh, says Tony is working on amazing dental. All right, thanks. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm working with ancient pathogens, especially with terminal and dairy at this moment on human domain. Thanks. Maria? Hi, I work on human dental calculus and pathogens from this human disease. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matthias? with candidate becomes. So can you repeat that? It, it's not a great connection. Okay. Uh, do you understand me? Okay. Um, I work with candidate becomes. Okay. Thanks. Merlin? Hi, sorry. I, uh, You're very quiet. Can you get closer to the microphone? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think my process crashing at the moment oh. <laughs> okay but as long as you hear me it's fine um, i'm working on uh, sedimentary dna and mostly focusing on mammalian dna all right thanks uh mohammed yes uh, i'm working in the microbiome and thanks uh, nicole i or are you just here as an observer <laughs> Okay, we'll move on. Nora? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm currently working on Bronze Age pathogens and microbiomes uh, from human remains. Uh, and I will, during my PhD, mom, just mainly work on human pathogens. Okay, thanks. Sandra says in the chat, she works in human age, birch, pitch, and teeth. Okay, thanks. Percy? Uh, so I'm currently working on uh, working with animal genomes, but I'll also uh, hopefully be working with some animal microbiome. Um, to make sure. Thanks. Philomena? Hey. So I'm also just starting my PhD and I'm based in archaeology, so um, I will have different studies. I work with really um, on a regional basis, so that's, this is going to be like, I don't know, a lot of samples probably assessing questions of mobility. I think it's going to be mostly human samples, but maybe also pathogens, depending on how that fits into my question, basically. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pooja? Yeah, hi. So, um, my research topic for PhD is that I study plant host associated root microbiome. So I see effect of uh, plant genetic traits that are various gene knockdown plants uh, and what effect does do they have on recruitment assembly function of root microbiome at the germination stage. Thanks. Reed? Hi. I uh, work mostly on late antique, early medieval uh, human samples, but also have a project looking at environmental DNA uh, from ice cores. Okay. 
things. Uh, Sierra. Hello, um, I work on ancient human calculus. Thanks. Trey. Hi, I am studying uh, pathogens in Neolithic farmers. Okay, thanks. And Uh I work with farming and calculus and all of the bio. All right, thanks. Okay, so it sounds like most people do work on mammalian associated microbiomes or uh, specific pathogenic species. Only a handful of people work on uh, sediments or other environmental samples. So this will be, in general, most helpful for, like I said, anyone who works on human or mammal associated microbiomes, simply because the organisms living in the environment are just much less well studied. And so we have a whole lot less information about what their genes do than we have for organisms that can potentially kill us or kill off agricultural, agriculturally important species. So just something to keep in mind as you're working, if you wanna get into functional analysis of say sedimental DNA, you'll have much more difficulty than if you're working on human samples. My thing's not moving, does it? Uh, Okay, so just uh, briefly about myself, I do work on mostly ancient dental calculus and modern dental calculus. My background is microbiology and uh, specifically oral microbiology is where I got my PhD. So I've been working in this area for quite a while and I find it particularly interesting compared to, for example, gut microbiomes, but there is a lot more focus on gut microbiomes, but you can actually get a lot more information about uh, multiple species interactions by studying oral microbiomes because it's actually been studied for a much longer time because oral microbiology is a much older field than gut microbiology. So I think it's a pretty interesting thing to study compared to the gut. And so that's what I will again be focusing on for this lecture. So now to get back into the lecture part of it, what is actually meant by microbial function? So in any situation where you have a bunch of bacteria living together, often in environments you get microbial growth as a biofilm. So as you can see on this slide, on one side you've got biofilm, on the other side you have the environment, which here is represented as blood vessel and gingival tissue. And all of this stuff that they're producing and spitting out and sharing between each other, that's all the function. So that's metabolites and proteins and anything else that they produce or that's found in the environment that they are interacting with. And that is function. So that's quite a complicated area to look at and to research. And actually looking at the genes that produce function is probably a lot more simple than looking at the actual proteins and metabolites themselves because we are, are much better equipped to study genetics than we are to study metabolites and proteins. So microbial functional analysis can tell you a whole lot more than just the taxonomy of an organism can tell you. So you can learn what those microbes will produce and what they can break down. Uh, how these can kill you, how they can be killed, for example, through antibiotics, and how microbes could be used in all sorts of things, such as bioremediation, whether they can break down oil from spills, whether they can sequester heavy metals from toxic dump sites, whether they can be used in medical treatment, such as for species transplants within the gut or within the oral microbiome, or whether they can be used in engineering for things such as batteries, uh, to clean marble statues, or to produce industrial plastics, and the list goes on and on. So there's a whole lot of use for microbes that's based specifically on what they do, which is their function. Basically, this can be summed up as function tells us how microbes interact with the world and how that can be harmful or beneficial. So why do we study microbial function? Because it can help us answer questions such as what's infecting the cows, what's spoiling the milk, and how can we cure and prevent it? So this is an example of how we used to study function in microbes or how it's been traditionally done for a very long time based on culturing which started, of course, long before we had sequencing technologies and before we could look at genomes. So this is an image of a test tube, a biochemical testing, where you have a series of glass tubes that have been filled with auger, which for anyone who's not familiar with this is basically a really thick jello, which has a bunch of nutrients and other chemicals added to it, which different bacteria can break down depending on the enzymes that they have and produce. And different species or even different strains within a species will contain different genes that encode different enzymes. And so by looking at what kind of reactions you get when you grow these species within this kind of environment where you've 
got a defined chemical environment and you know what kinds of reactions can occur with those chemicals, then you can try to figure out what genes are present and from that infer what species are present. And so in this case, uh, this is an example of a test tube where each of these started out looking like the control on the far left where they're red. That color indicates that there's a pH dye in there where if any uh, acid is being produced, the color will turn yellow. And then there's clearly some other things in there that can uh, produce other things such as gas, which you can see here from particularly the middle one where the agar has actually split because there's so much gas produced, it forced the agar apart. And then it can also, uh, there's something in there that will help the bacteria if they have the right enzyme produce hydrogen sulfide, which is what turns the tubes black there at the bottom. So uh, in the past, the way that we would figure out what kinds of functions these microbes have and basically what this would be used for is figuring out how you could treat an infection or uh, something like that. You would culture up your organism on whatever agar you could get it to grow on. And then you would culture it into these tubes with a series of different biochemicals. And you would let it go overnight. And then you would look at the reactions that occurred. And you would say, OK, well, these reactions tell me that this is happening. And these match or don't match the results that we have. And then we know that we could treat with this antibiotic or that antibiotic, or we shouldn't treat with a certain antibiotic based on the enzymes that these uh, species are producing. So as an example here, the first tube, which is red, it's just sp supposed to be essentially the same as the control, no major reactions occurred. So if we're going to use an example of what's spoiling the milk, in this case, there were no chemical reactions or biochemical reactions occurring with this species in the tube. So very likely this is not the organism that was spoiling anything. In the second tube, we can see production of acid because the tube turned yellow. So in this case, if we're looking at milk spoilage, this would indicate that that organism could be curdling the milk. A second, or the, yeah, the species three, we see gas production in addition to acid production. So in this case, we would see curdling and inflated jar. In species four, with the hydrogen sulfide, we would get a rotten egg smell. We would get curdling from the acid production and an uh, inflated jar from gas production. And then the fifth species, we would get a rotten egg smell and an inflated jar, but no curdling of the milk. So based on this, then you could say, all right, we must have species four is the one that's spoiling the milk. And based on this, we know that we should be treating the cows with something to get rid of that particular species. But nowadays we have sequencing. So instead of growing them up and performing these kinds of extensive biochemical tests, we can just look at the genome and try to infer what they would be doing based on the genes that are present and not whether or not they're actually expressing those genes in, uh, in culture. So where do we get functional information in a metagenome or in an ancient metagenome? So you start out with the same kind of approach that you take for taxonomic classification, where you have a database that's full of sequenced genomes of species that, have, that are known and well characterized. And these genomes in your database will have gene annotations on them. So you start with your metagenome, which is your random collection of short reads that came from all sorts of species that are in your microbiome to start with. And you align all of those reads against the, the genomes in your database. And then to get metagenome, uh, meta taxonomic classification, you then group all those reads that align by the species of the genomes that they align to, and you get a species table. And then inevitably, you're always going to have a bunch of reads that are not classified. I don't know whether or not Maxine talked about this, but we just sort of ignore that, although it, it can be a substantial amount of information because we can't do anything with it if we don't know what it is. But in contrast, if you want functional information, instead of classifying all of your aligned reads by the species of the genomes that they align to, you can classify them by the genes that they align to, in which case you'll have a whole bunch of reads that align to different species and different genomes being classified together. And in some cases, you'll want to be able to separate that out later. In some cases, it doesn't really matter. But either way, you'll get a table that's essentially just like your species table, where you have a count of the reads that align to each gene in each of your samples. And again, you're still going to have quite a few reads that are left over and not classified. But in contrast to not being able to classify a read for taxonomic reasons, there's a different reason. There's an additional reason that you might not be able to classify reads functionally. And that is the fact that many microbial genomes, in fact, all microbial genomes, have genes of unknown function. And so if we don't know what they do, we can't really classify them. So this is a table that gives an example of a bunch of really well-known, well-studied laboratory organisms. So the first set, Streptogordonii, strep mutans, E. coli, Yersinia pestis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and Staph aureus here. These are all heavily studied lab strains. And the total gene count in each of these organisms is shown here in the total CDS column. And the number of hypothetical CDS or genes with no annotation is shown 
in the next column, and then the percentage of genes that are hypothetical is shown in the last column. And you can see this can range anywhere from 3% in E. coli K12, which is probably the most heavily studied single microorganism on the planet, up to about 14% in Streptococcus gordonii, which is an oral organism that's um, representative of an oral healthy associated species. So it ranges quite a bit. In species that are not as well characterized, for example, Tanarella forsythia and Disulfobulbus oralis down here, which are also members of the oral cavity, and anyone working on dental calculus will encounter these quite a bit, the number is much higher. You have about 17% of the genes that are left as hypothetical and we don't know what they do. And this is largely because they aren't expressed in the culture in which we grow them in the lab. And so if we can never get them to express, we can't figure out what they do. So you do have to go back to the lab to get this kind of information, but it's a very time consuming. It can be quite a tricky thing to do. So it's something to be aware of. The more species, the less well characterized the species that you're working with. So as you're moving away from pathogenic organisms, as you're moving into microbiomes, as you're moving out of the human body and into other mammals and then away from, from mammals and into the environment, you're going to have higher and higher numbers of unclassified genes within genomes. So it's something to keep in mind as you're doing functional classification. We are much more limited in our functional annotations than we are in our taxonomic annotations. So how can the gene table be used? Once we have our gene classification, there are two major steps we can take for analysis with this. The first is for looking at single species, and the second is by looking at the entire metagenome. And we can actually em employ the single species approach within the metagenome approach, so I'll discuss that first. And that is particularly to generate a pangenome. So a pangenome is when you take a single species or a bunch of closely related species and you look at all of the genes in all of the sequenced isolates of that species or group of species, and you make a big table where you have all of those genes listed out in all of your isolates. So this is a visual representation of a pan genome in which each line indicates a genome of the species that are listed here, and going down each column is a gene. If the gene is present, then there's a dark mark. If the gene is absent, it's lighter. And you can see that there are some genes that are heavily present in many organisms, but there are many more genes that are found only in certain organisms. And so pan genomes represent the entire repertoire of genes that a species or a group of closely related organisms can contain and the entire representation of the function that they could perform. But it doesn't tell you for sure what any single isolate can do because there is so much variation even within a single species. But this is very useful if you want to do, for example, pathogen analysis or particular organism analysis, and you want to see what genes have been introduced or lost through time within a particular organism or set of organisms, then pangenome analysis is a really good approach for that. There are lots of tools that you can use for pangenome analysis, so I'm not going to go over any of those today, but this is a review that covers quite a few of them and talks about the techniques and the pros and cons of them. So if you're thinking about doing pangenome analysis for your single species analyses, then I would recommend reading a review like this one so that you can get an idea of what would work well for you so that you have a place to start um, and try out some of the programs that exist. A note for pangenome analysis though, a lot of the genome, well, all of the genomes that you download from NCBI will be annotated, but they're all annotated in the way that whoever uploaded them chose to annotate them. And there are a lot of different ways to annotate a microbial genome and a lot of different names per gene for many microbial genes. And so different annotation programs will use different versions of gene names. And if you are not aware that two gene names are actually the same gene, then it, it makes clustering for pangenome analysis um, a complete mess. So if you do want to do pangenome analysis, don't use annotations from NCBI. You should annotate, download FASTA files from NCBI, annotate them exactly the same way that you've annotated your own genomes that come from your own ancient metagenome samples so that all of the annotations are exactly the same. And that way you're not going to end up with a big mess when you're trying to do pangenome analysis, thinking that you don't have the same genes or you have a lot more genes than you should or anything like that. Make sure everything is consistent to start. There are different programs for performing annotation. The first and only one that came to mind for me because I've used it before is Rory, but there are certainly other ones out there and you can look into those and decide which annotation program you like best. So then the other approach that you can take with a gene table is to look at more metagenome focused 
the entire genome content of your entire community or the metabolic pathway content of your entire community. So this is gonna be what I'm focusing the rest of the talk on because this is more what I do. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of tools briefly for gene content analysis that I've used. One is called Adder. This is a Megan tool. So if you have the program Megan downloaded, if you go into the tools folder, you'll see an Adder build script and an Adder run script. This performs DNA alignment almost exactly the same way that Malt works. And uh, like Malt, it is very database dependent. It can use a lot of memory and it can take a very long time to run. And so unfortunately, although it's a quite a nice program, I stopped using it because it can just take too much memory and too much time to run and it's not very efficient. So I would use that one if it were more practical, but unfortunately I've had to move away from that one. There's another program called Paladin, which performs protein alignment. So it translates the short reads into protein sequences and then aligns those against a protein database, which is much lighter and faster. And I liked that one, except that it's not actively maintained. So if you have any questions about it, they won't be answered. And so I moved away from using that one. And at the moment, I'm mostly using Human3, which performs both DNA and protein alignment. And it's part of the BioBakery suite. So Maxime talked to you about Metaflin for taxonomic classification. So if you like to use tools that are all really consistent in the way that they work, Human3 would make a great complement to Metaflin. But they also have a bunch of other tools that, that all work together quite well. So they have Lefsa for differential abundance, Maslin for associations with metadata, and things like that. So I today will be focusing on talking about Human3 because even though I don't actually like this one very much, I I I found it's okay for oral microbiome work. It's good for gut microbiome work. It's not very good for anything that's not host associated. So anything environmental, you will get very little information out of human three and you would be better off trying other tools. But this is unfortunately where I've settled for my work, which is mostly the oral microbiome. So for the next part, I will walk through the steps of human three and how it actually works. So this is just an overview that they presented in their paper for human two. So this is a program that they've updated several times. I think Tahina talked about it. So human three is the same as human two, except that it's got a better database. So it's the same approach. So for human two or human three, you start out with your metagenome and um, Sample, you have a bunch of short reads that come from a bunch of species, some of which have known taxonomy, some of which do not have known taxonomy. And you can actually also perform uh, RNA classification with human if you're doing transcriptomics, but obviously anyone working on ancient samples is unlikely to be performing transcriptomics. So the first step in human analysis is it takes your metagenome sample and it aligns all of your short reads against a marker gene database, which is identical to the marker gene database that Metaflon uses to try to identify which species are in there. So in this case, you'll get some of your reads aligning to some of the species in the marker gene database, but you'll have a collection of reads that don't align to anything. Then in the next step, it takes the species that your reads align to, and it goes to another database, and it pulls out a pan genome of those species so that it has a representation of all of the genes found in those species of all of the known sequenced organisms or isolates of those species. And it creates a subset of database with just the pan genomes of those species that were identified in step one. And then it takes all of the reads and aligns all of the reads against this pan genome database. So at this step, it can tell you that it has reads that align to genes X, one, and Y from species one, from X and two, from species two, et cetera, down the line. But again, you have a bunch of reads that are not going to align to your species pan genome here. And so then in a next step, it takes all of those reads that didn't align to your pan genome and it will translate them into protein. And then it will align those protein sequences against a protein database that's not necessarily linked to any particular species. And it will try to get at least a gene functional annotation out of the protein alignments, even if it can't get a species alignment. But still at that step, you're gonna have a lot of unmapped reads. They couldn't be aligned to the species pan genome. They couldn't be aligned when they were translated to protein. There are several reasons for this. Uh, when you translate a short read into protein, it becomes even shorter. I think we've talked about this in some other day, but when that happens, then you lose a lot of information and it becomes much harder to specifically align it to something. So it could be that it's too short to be informative. 
It could be that it's so short that it matches to too much and that program can't decide what it should align to. Or it could just be that there really is no representation in the database of the gene from the, which those reads are derived. But again, you're going to have this problem of a lot of unmapped reads uh, in your sample. Even human samples have this problem. And then what it does is it takes all of that alignment information and it gathers it up together and it puts together a feature table. So it will give you counts for your genes and it will give you counts for your genes by the species that were aligned to it. And then as a final step, it will take that information from the genes that it has and it will try to group those genes together into pathways so that it can give you, in addition to a gene table, a metabolic pathway table to try to give you a more broad idea of what kinds of, of metabolic pathways can be um, present in your samples that, that would tell you actually more than just a single gene by itself. So what is a metabolic pathway and why do we want it if we have gene counts? So pathways are proteins processing molecules in sequence. So these are really what's important within any kind of cellular organism um, because this is how metabolic products go from one thing to another thing and how they're useful in between. So this is an example of a bunch of pathways. This is a KEV map for central carbohydrate metabolism. And in a, a map like this, it shows a whole bunch of different pathways. And in each pathway, you have the molecules that are either the starting molecule or they're being worked on throughout the pathway. And those are represented by dots that have names. So in this case here, dot, this is a um, metabolite. Here's a metabolite, here's a metabolite, here's a metabolite. And then it has arrows indicating where, you know, metabolite, here turns into metabolite here, um, metabolite here turns into metabolite here. And across each of these lines is a box with a number. And these numbers indicate enzymes that act to convert metabolite here to metabolite here. And in some cases, you can have multiple enzymes that perform this. And so by taking the genes that we have and putting them all together into something like a pathway, this tells us then what can we expect if we give an organism a certain metabolite? What will it produce? Will it be able to use that or will it not be able to use that or uh, metabolite will not be able to do anything with it. So here the glycolysis pathway is highlighted where we start with glucose and we end up with pyruvate. It goes through a series of enzyme conversions into a whole bunch of different metabolites through a bunch of different enzymes to get out pyruvate, which is then used in the cell in another set of me metabolic reactions. So it's, it's much more functionally informative if you can get pathway information, but because this has put together all of these random genes into an informative um, collection so that you're not just looking at random genes going, I'm not sure exactly what the function is, but this, this is a way of condensing the information into what is actually informative at a cellular level. So when new organisms are studied, looking at the metabolic pathways they, they can participate in is a major part of characterizing those organisms. So this is an example of a recently described organism called Thermovibrio aminificans. And this was just an example from their paper showing that this organism can produce a whole bunch of different, well, I guess a lot of this, yeah, small molecule metabolites. It can do, participate in the TCA cycle. It can take in NO3, it can put out ammonia. So these are sorts of things that are important for us to know about an organism and to understand how it interacts with its environment. So functional metabolic pathway analysis is an important part of understanding microbial life. This is just another example of that. You can see what sorts of, of pathways people look at in organisms that can also tell us a lot about the environment that they're able to live in and the other interactions they may have with other organisms that live in that same environment. So when we look at pathways at a metagenome scale, what you can do is look at what pathways are enriched in metagenomes associated with one, say, disease versus another disease or one condition versus another condition. And you can look at whether or not the entire pathway is upregulated between two conditions. So this is an example of a metabolic pathway map where metabolic pathways marked in yellow were upregulated in microbiome samples in dental plaque samples from individuals who had a periodontal disease compared to individuals who are healthy. And so this can tell us that, well, the actions of a particular metabolic pathway may be influencing a particular disease. And from this information, you can then dig down and try to figure out, well, what species are producing the enzymes that participate in those pathways? Because maybe then you wanna target those particular species or the particular enzymes from those species to try to reduce the severity of disease or to try to cure disease or prevent it from occurring. So in this case, 
This is uh, an example of one of those pathways where the enzymes are numbered here and the metabolites are all listed out here. And these little heat maps show us whether or not each of these specific bacterial species, which are listed out by name here, contained the enzyme uh, for each of these steps. So you don't always find that all of the organisms contain or are producing all of the enzymes within a metabolic pathway. And so this does show that there is a lot of overlap, a lot of gene redundancy within microbiomes. And so not each organism has to have every enzyme because they can rely on each other to actually produce the final products of a full pathway. And that is beneficial to an organism to not have to produce every gene for every pathway. And so here, so we have some genes are produced by PE and PG, but it turns out for this pathway, all genes are produced by FN. And then there's a lot more variation in this histidine degradation pathway with regarding which species contain the enzymes or produce the enzymes for which steps in this pathway. So this then can be fed back into how do we treat a disease? How do we uh, know what species may be particularly pathogenic in a case like this? So to get back to human three, after it performs its gene classification and its pathway reduction from those genes, you get three files out. You get a gene family abundance profile, you get a pathway abundance profile, and you get a pathway coverage file. Now, for the most part, you'll work with the gene family profile and the pathway abundance profile. And the pathway coverage file is much less useful um, unless you actually want to understand the yeah, the gene coverage within each pathway, which is much harder to interpret. And so for the most part, I don't think even the people who developed human two use that one for very much. So you don't have to worry too much about that one. But what does it mean then that these tables are stratified by species? Oh, I forgot why this slide is here. Okay, so just then a quick overview genes. We look at genes because this can identify specific genes that are enriched for further investigation of those um, within a sample. We look at pathways because this can identify a whole series of genes that act on a metabolite in sequence, and the whole series of genes may be enriched rather than just a single gene. And those can tell us different information about the presence and abundance or actions of microorganisms within this genome community. So yes, what does it mean to have these tables stratified by species? So what you get out from human two will be a table that looks something like this, where you have your genes listed down. You always have an entry for unmapped, and this will always in all of your samples be the highest value that you have. No way around it. You just kind of have to throw that out and hope that as time goes on, we can slowly reduce that unmapped amount as we increase our databases and get more annotations on genes. But then you'll have an entry for gene one in which you have basically everything that is from each species summed into a final value, and then you have it broken down by the species assignments and then the unclassified, which comes from that uh, secondary protein assignment step or protein alignment step. And what you'll usually see is that unclassified can be quite high. And the an important point to remember here is that the sum from the unclassified in each of the individual species will always be higher than what you see totaled here for gene for the gene itself for each gene and this is very confusing but it has something to do with how the human two is doing normalizing and counting and i cannot explain it i think they have explanations people have asked about it in their their help pages and things like that but you don't have to worry about it if you look at it just don't think about the facts that your counts will never add up that's something to do with their normalization. Your, your counts here will usually be lower than everything totaled together, but you get the same pattern repeated throughout for every gene that's identified. So you have a total count, count per species, count for the proteins that couldn't be identified based on a species all the way down. So this is an example of what the table from human two looks like straight out. You have your gene here, and then you have your counts their counts because human two is doing a normalization by reads per kilobase, um, which has something to do with the amount of reads that have been lined across a certain length of your DNA, which again, I think that they probably explain in quite a lot of detail, but I can't explain it to you very well. And I just sort of accept that this is what it is. There's one question from mm -hmm. the chat, which is, is the unclassified then meaningful in any way to the 
uh, depends on which unclassified. Yeah, so I would say it's definitely informative because it doesn't always matter what species is contributing a gene. Simply the fact that it is there is often more important than who is producing it. And so I think that it is very important to have this information. And I almost never work with the stratified information. I almost always work with just the totaled information, which of course then takes everything all together into account. So I would say the unmapped is not informative, but the unclassified is definitely informative. So just as an example, this is what it often looks like. So you can see it's stratified by species or unclassified. And you'll always have this Uniref 90 and then a code here that is the Uniref code for a particular gene because this is the standard database that human uses for its first steps. So then the first thing that you usually do with human output is normalize to copies per million rather than reads per kilobase, although I'm not super sure that it matters which one you work with. They're both normalized, but typically we then take it, we normalize it to copies per million. So that's one step of the, after you run human two, there's a bunch of what they call utility scripts. So this is one of the utility scripts is usually the first one that you run on your output. And then the next thing that you do is you group your genes based on a classification system. So human two or human three provides these classification systems for proteins. And these are just different methods that have been developed by different groups who work on genes and enzymes and proteins to group them together in ways that are informative in a hierarchical, hierarchical structure so that we can get more information so that we could say certain genes are involved in carbohydrate processing or in amino acid processing or in DNA processing, nucleotide processing, and that sort of thing so that we have a way of structuring the functional information that we get. And these are all different there is some overlap between them which one you use really depends on what you're familiar with and what you're comfortable with interpreting and if you're completely unfamiliar with all of them just jump in and try things and see what other groups are using and maybe base it on that but if you're interested um, you can look at the different uh, websites to try to understand what exactly they're doing unipro is a big protein based database. Uh, Metasic, I was unfamiliar with until I started using Human2, and they have a lot of information on metabolic pathways. I'm still not exactly sure what they do or how their classification system works or what it's tied into, but it's sort of useful. KEG is a highly structured um, database that's got a lot of functional information. I like KEG. Um, unfortunately, they're a pay for service at this point. So you are limited to the last, huh? Thousand euros. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really expensive um, to get their latest database. So you're stuck at something like a 2013 release. So even though it's nicely organized and it, it makes a lot of sense, you're limited to the fact that it's quite old, unless you have the money or the institutional license to use the most recent version. Gene ontology I found is very uninformative for microbes. I think it's fine for eukaryotic organisms. I completely avoid it, but a lot of people like it because it is so organized. I just don't think that it's organized in a way that's informative for microbes. Enzyme commission, I don't actually know whether this includes anything that isn't an enzyme, but of course there are lots of proteins that are not enzymes. So I tend to avoid that one just because I don't know if I'm missing information because they're not enzymes. And PFAM and Eggnog, I'm actually not that familiar with. I've never worked with them myself. Um, but if you have, you know, pick what you like and go with that. Um, if I was asked to briefly describe what is an ortholog versus what is a paralog, which is mostly related to the keg terminology here. So these are the official definitions. An ortholog where orthologs are homologous genes that have diverged from each other as a consequence of speciation, whereas paralogs are homologous genes that have diverged from each other as a consequence of genetic duplication. So what I could think of as an example here is the amylase gene in humans. Unfortunately, I can't think of a microbial example, but in humans, we have multiple copies of, actually, that's not a good idea. Okay, so in humans, we have pancreatic amylase was the original amylase gene that got duplicated and is now expressed in salivary glands and salivary amylase. So those two are uh, paralogs because they started out from the same gene. There was a duplication and then a specialization of the two genes throughout 
evolution. Orthologs, I suppose, would be like pancreatic amylase from humans and dogs. So keg orthologs are a way of classifying genes that are the same gene in other organisms based on or based on evolutionary speciation. So after you group your genes, you get a table that looks like this. So in this case, I grouped them by metastic reaction. So even though these are genes, they have this RXN. So we have a 1.1.1.271 RXN is the gene name in this case. And we have the first entry, which is everything summed together. We have the species specific entries, and then we have our unclassified entry. And while this is nice to have the genes now grouped together with a particular um, method, probably you're not gonna know what most of these are based on these names. And so there's another utility script that human offers that will allow you to add names to genes. So you can run that and then your table is gonna look something like this where you have the gene, the gene name and then you're gonna have the actual name of the gene so that you can know what it is. So in this case, 1.1.1.271 RXN is the GDP L fucose synthase. And this uh, 1.1.271 notation, you can tell is an enzyme commission number because they have this four number or four digit system. So that's why you'll see it here. So this means that Metasic just used the enzyme commission name and it's repeated here because it comes from XPC, which is the server that hosts the enzyme commission. So there is overlap between the, the methods for classifying genes. And that's why you'll see some of these things duplicated. But this is the name that most people will use, although chances are there are two or three other names, like speakable names for this gene. And this is just what this one uses. But you can then use this if you actually wanna try to get more information about them just by looking at the names. So you would know that this particular enzyme participates in conversion of GDPL glucose. The pathway table is quite similar, and I process both the pathway table and the gene table almost essentially identically. You get a pathway table that looks something like this, which is almost identical to the gene table where you have your pathway. It does already come with the name of the pathway as part of the output table. So you have your first row, which is everything summed together, broken down by species, and then unclassified. In this uh, example here, this pathway is largely contribu contributed by genes from this Tanarella for Scythia in these first set of samples here. And this is a way of briefly looking at this and pulling some information out of the table. Okay, so that's an overview of human. So now we're going to jump into actually analyzing human output ourselves and trying to understand what we can learn from functional annotation. And James will take over from here. So let me just get set up. So if you can open your terminals in the in your compute nodes, so you can see this as well. It's yeah, okay. I usually put something under that corner and I've got it. Okay. 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 In. No, thank you, Google. Nope. Uh, let me just make sure the chat is open. Again, if you can just shout out uh, either by un unmuting yourself and shouting out if necessary or in the chat and we'll answer some questions. So today for the functional profiling practical session, we're going to go back to R and, and R notebook. So to start, could you please activate, if you're not already in there, the uh, corresponding environment today. So for me, this. Oh. And then you change the default volume as always. And then 5C. So 5C from Twitchonomics. If you do LS, you should see a bunch of files like this. Is everyone, is everyone in that directory now? And you're seeing these sort of files? Please put your thumbs up or hands up. Getting there, getting there. Yeah, so I think that's everybody now. If you're not there, you're stuck, please shout in the, in the chat. And we are going to open our studio by typing our studio and then the 
WSS underscore function human three GFs RMB file. So the command should look like this. When you do that, R Studio should open, and you may have uh, the presentation from Clemens open. You can ask me open, ask you to just shut that down if you want. And it is a different tab, but you don't have to. Do that. Does everyone now see the R Studio window? Is there anyone who is not seeing the R Studio window? This may be a better question to ask. Put your hands up if you're not seeing the R Studio window. If you write the command, I will try and paste it over. Give me one moment. So make sure you are in the make sure you are in uh, the directory. And I have to learn how to use a Mac again. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Well, I've set mine up even differently. So. Oh, you set up differently. Well, this can be more fun. How do I right click? On the right. Ah, OK. To me, it's intuitive. Some people think it's not. Uh, let's see if this works. There we go. And I've lost my cursor again. I'm going. Yeah. There you go. Okay, sorry. So has everyone got it? Oh, anyone still lost in our studio? No, good. Okay. So what we're gonna do, if you are not familiar with our studio, although I think most people should be, um, there's two ways of running the commands that will be in your script blocks. The script blocks are uh, indicated by these triple back ticks here and a bit of meta information. You can either press the green run chunk, which you see on the far right hand side, or if you select the line with the code and do control enter, it should activate uh, and send it to your terminal, the console at the bottom. So in this case, you probably don't need to worry if this says cannot run the command here. You should already be in there in the uh, content environment on your terminal in which you loaded our studio. The first thing we're going to do is actually run the loading libraries section. Um, most of the libraries we're loading today are very similar to what uh, Clemens introduced on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. Sorry, um, basically just tables for sorry libraries for manipulating tables, loading tables, um, plotting, and so on. So ggplot or no, not ggplot. Well, tidyverse. Anyway, um, but the important one that we're going to use today is called mixomics, which is a sort of a Swiss Army knife um, statistical package for processing omics data um, in various contexts and also combining different data as well. Um, there are many ways of doing, uh, sort of many other packages do similar things, but this is the one we're going for today. So you can either press the green run chunk and you should get a lot of information at the bottom here. And you should end up with um, uh, the last command being ops chunk. So if everyone can run that, Note, if you do go with the control enter method, it'll go one, uh, one command at a time. Does that run for everybody? Loaded all your packages, no errors? Patricia is working. Jamie, Davide, Maria, good. It doesn't come with anything from come into session preloaded, does it? It starts coming? Yes. Okay. Because actually, if you load the summons after Tidyverse, it overwrites some things from Tidyverse, and that causes problems. OK, so a warning uh, for Marina, if you, if you didn't hear already, if you do want to use uh, Mixomics, you have to be aware that Mixomics will overwrite things from Tidyverse, so functions and so on. So it's very important to load Mixomics first and then Tidyverse. OK, so once you've done that, you may have to scroll past all of the messages. And we need to run the next thing, which is a little bit of uh, our food to make sure that we are in the right directory. So please run this one. This is the nitar ops nit command. You don't really have to know what this does. It's just to make sure you're in the right place so you can load the data quickly. By the time you figure out what it's doing, you'll be pretty good at R. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so 
The next section is actually getting to our data. So we're not, as Irina said earlier, not going to run human three. This requires very large databases and is very, very slow. But uh, Irina has put here um, example commands that you would theoretically run to actually generate the data that would go into this notebook, but you could then actually adapt, adapt for your own purposes. Um, so just to very briefly describe some of the, the commands that we have here. The first one is actually just running the alignment of your uh, sequencing reads against um, a given database, with the default being That's their... you, you, no, uh, something called Chocoflan, which is of a, a database they also develop with all the genes in it. Then you have a, a couple of sort of auxiliary script commands, one to join the tables together, because normally you'd run um, each sample uh, independently, so one after, one after each other. So you combine all of the output of those into one table. Then we would re, uh, normalize the table. So you can, there's multiple ways of normalization. And so you can actually select which one you want to do with this command. So you can see you're taking the joined table, spitting out the normalized one. And in this case, you can select, for example, the TSS, uh, uh, so total sum scaling normalization there. And then um, we have, uh, a regrouping table, so basically if you want to order in a more logical sense based on different um, categories, you can regroup the table. It's basically just reordering the, the rows of the different uh, entries. And then also we want to attach informative human readable names um, instead of just having the IDs of the, in this case, well, yeah, the Chocoflan IDs. In this case, making them with the MetaPsych uh, uh, human readable names. And so this is the input that we'll be dealing with today. You don't need to run this, this script block. And in fact, we won't do it because eval f. But that's just for you to be aware of how you would theoretically generate the tables we'll be manipulating today. So the first thing we want to do now is actually load the data that Arena has uh, already generated for you. We can then do a little bit of cleanup. So actually um, clean up some of the column names because the, by default, the, the file names that are loaded, sorry, the sample names are loaded are based on the files. And also we'll remove the unmapped and ungrouped reads um, that Irina mentioned earlier, which are sometimes useful, sometimes not. Um, yeah, and in this case, once you have the groupings done, you'll have this additional file called, uh, for genes, it's un ungrouped for pathways, it's called unintegrated. And that means for genes, it wasn't able to put the gene into a group that must be a single gene that has no other known associated similar genes or orthologs. And then for pathways, unintegrated means it couldn't take that gene uh, and put it into a metabolic pathway, probably because it doesn't know what metabolic pathway it participates in. And so it wasn't able to be incorporated into the, the pathway table or the gene table for those reasons. And so in this command here, this filter, we are removing those pathways essentially. So we will run these. You can run these commands now, either with the green arrow, the green triangle, or pressing Control Enter. I like to go Control Enter because I can see step by step exactly what's happening and make sure I don't lose the, er the errors in the console. So we load the file. We convert this to a tibble, which is the tidy data format. We rename some columns, and then finally we remove all of our unmapped and unintegrated pathways. Did anyone have any errors with this section? Because if not, then we will start to move a little bit faster. Ah, so there's a question from Maria asking, does not uh, understand why we need normalization? I think this is mostly because of different sequencing depths. You'll have not all of your libraries are going to be sequenced to exactly the same number of reads, so you'll have some variation in there. And then the species are going to be at different abundance levels within each of your samples. And so the number of reads that come from each species is going to be higher when you sequence more, lower when you sequence less. So species that are highly abundant to start with, you'll pick up more reads. Species that are low abundance, you'll get less reads from. And so you need a way with different sequencing depths and with different levels of abundance of these species within each library, you need some way of of getting all of your data to be similar in that you're not going to have high levels of particular species or genes within some samples just because you have a higher abundance in that sample versus 
uh, lower abundance in other samples or just because you have higher sequencing depth and it was able to pick up lower abundance species, whereas in the sample with less se sequencing depth, you couldn't pick up the same lower abundance species. It's a way of making sure that everything can be statistically compared, really. It's a way of making sure that your data is statistically comparable. Yeah. And so, like, sorry, I have another question. So, would your parameter to start from would be the least uh, abundant one, for example, and then you normalize accordingly? No. no. So, in this case, what human does is it looks at the number of reads that were mapped against. So, you have all of your genes that will, in your pan genome, will total up to a certain number of bases. And it will say, okay, across over all of those bases, we had 50% of those covered. And it will normalize based on that coverage across samples rather than a depth or something like that. And that's, so in this case, CPM would be copies per million and it calculates that based on the coverage across the bases. And this is a, a way that human two specifically does normalization. Other programs don't have this kind of internal normalization and you would have to choose a method to do it. And I'm sure somewhere on their website, they describe why they do it this particular way, but it is something that is specifically built into human too and it's not found in other programs. Thank you. Okay, I'll just see if I can try and zoom in. I've done in our studio, so that's... Is that a bit better? HKI, the HKI code, a little bit bigger. Does it have some error? Oops, yeah, that's quite far, far back. Uh, Does it matter? Where is Ops chunk? I'm not sure why that is. I would just say, is that just Follow what I'm doing on the screen. You don't have to run these necessarily. It's mostly just running all the code blocks. So just follow what I'm describing for the time being. Um, OK, so one important thing to consider is obviously you can have all of your gene families and stuff like and, and gene pathways uh, in, your, in, your, in your analysis, but it's all basically irrelevant unless you have something to compare between. Um, so it's always very useful to have your metadata this is sort of what we we're talking about the importance of on Tuesday, but basically having um, as much information about your samples as possible and in a very standardized manner, and which is very easy to sort of load by into computers and filter and so on. And so in this case, the, the data we'll be um, sort of simulating analyzing is from a bioarchive preprint actually that Arena has currently, where um, she and colleagues have tried to compare. Um, basically the microbiomes uh, from a dental calculus of different individuals, different variety of different um, pathologies and sort of other sort of osteological diseases. And in specifically, they were trying to look at the differences. Is there any link between the dental pathologies seen by the osteologists on the sort of in the teeth and on the on the jaws um, or sort of, yeah, the skull uh, versus the oral microbiome as inferred from dental calculus. And so we're going to load um, the metadata of all of these individuals with the next section. So we load the metadata file. And then just for you to get an idea of uh, what we're looking at, you can run the next command and it should print for you um, a subset of the different metadata that we have. So we have, for example, the site, the uh, Nimbimshta, which time period is from, the library ID, sequencing instrument, whether it has a pipe notch, so indicating the person was a heavy smoker or not. Then we have the uh, periodontitis score, as estimated by the um, osteologist, and the percentage of teeth with caries. And so this is going to be very important later on when we try to visualize and see, or separate out the different groups depending on the different um, uh, the pathways that we find. Uh, the next thing we need to do is prepare a couple of functions, sort of custom functions, uh, which basically will allow us to visualize um, um, the PCAs generated by mix omics, but with ggplot. In this case, I'd highly recommend just pressing the green uh, run chunk uh, button because this is a very long code chunk. So I'm going to do this here now. And let's run all of that. So I'd recommend everyone do that as well. So load the metadata and run this and then scroll down to the next section. 
I would just jump in and say, this is not necessary. You can do all of this step by step wise, as I'm sure Clement showed you how to do. This is just something that I did for myself because I was running a lot of these and by having a function, I could have all of the, the script written out once and then I have just a very short command that I need to run to print a whole bunch of images. So you, you don't have to worry about doing it this way when you're starting out. Exactly. We're also very a bit particular about how plots look in our group, and so we spend a lot, spend or waste a lot of time uh, trying to customize this sort of thing. Anyway, so scroll through all the th I think three plots until you see the next description. Is everyone following? Everyone still with me? All stuck behind. Good. Good. Beauty thinks we're nodding. It's nice to see people's faces. Okay, so the next important thing, as Tina has described uh, on uh, Tuesday with the introduction to ancient DNA, we often have bad samples. Some samples just have no ancient DNA in them, just on all contamination um, or environmental taxa. Um, so we normally want to remove these um, for downstream analysis, but also we include them quite far into the analysis as we often do want to compare what badly preserved samples look like versus good samples. So in this case, Irina actually kept, um, has actually ran human uh, three against all of the all of the data. So all of the samples, even if they're badly preserved, and in fact also um, extraction and library blanks. But for um, our purposes here, we assume that we know they're badly preserved, so we want to get rid of them. So we want to basically make a list of these, which we will later on uh, remove. So you can run the next block to basically prepare that list of sample names we will remove from our table. Um, and yeah, so these were detected as outliers based on the uh, decontam? No, sorry. No, uh, part of it was Cooper deck and part of it was just a PCA to see where they plot with no filtering. Yeah, okay, exactly. So one was to use the Cooper deck thingy that I came up with in my last paper, which Tina mentioned with these curves, um, and then also generating PCA plots of the, of the sort of taxonomic classification uh, so, so see, okay, we see that these fall more like with bone or more like soil, so we, we mark those down. Okay, so now we have our cleaned up data. So we have, so we have the, the pathway tables, we have the metadata, and we have removed the bad samples from the, the pathway table. Um, and the first question is, do we see any functional relationships between the groups? So do we see any distinctive patterns based on the metadata that we have described with our different individuals? So we'll do a little bit of more cleanup um, to actually remove the outliers. Then we're going to normalize the tables um, by our, uh, CLR, so centered this, log ratio. Sorry. Yeah, so this normalization is one that's done specifically to run the PCA. This isn't necessary for other forms of analysis because you have normalized the data within itself with the, the either TSS or CPM within human. So if you remember, I think from both Tina and also Maxine, uh, CLR normalization is often used to allow to fit our data into sort of classical statistical techniques, um, and PCA is sort of one of these. So this is what we're going to run now. So we're going to basically um, do some cleanup. So we remove the some samples with insufficient metadata. We we'll remove some of the library blanks. Um, we will then convert the table into a format which mix, um, Mixomics will basically accept. In this on line 360, we'll actually run the PCA itself. Actually, that one is determining the number of components to run. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, my cursor was over the function <laughs> name. So yeah, we determine the number of components to actually uh, to generate the PCA based on. Um, which is sort of partly uh, also represented in the screen plot, we'll generate a second. And then we actually run the PCA with the, with the PCA function. And then we do a little bit of cleanup of the, um, uh, the output from that to allow us to visualize a bit more information in the second part. No. That's for later on. That's for later yeah. on. Sorry. So you can also run these now. As a recap, we're going to. Ooh, sorry, it's a little bit slow. We'll firstly clean up the table to remove the bad samples. We'll then tune the PCA. But we're not, I missed that one, sorry. No, I mean, it's a bit slow. Uh, 
There we go. So we actually see already it explains how much proportion on each PC that it's being run on. This is also what is often displayed in, in the screen plot. Then we run the PC itself. And then we just clean up a little bit of that for a, a later step. And we should actually see, I think, the screen plot here. Oh, no, run that's the nice. other ones, it closed the image. Oh, cool. uh, that was this one, no? Yeah. OK, so this tuning of the PCA should, ah, there we go, yes, indeed. So you should actually see when you run that, actually, and uh, I should say, if you ran the whole block with the green button, you should actually see this as well. I just lost it because I went step by step. This plot basically shows you the proportion of the variance that, it, that is explained by um, each component. So when you remember the PCAs, it's essentially a scatter plot. And then each axis, normally um, the x-axis displays the, the component with the greatest variation explained. And then the y-axis, the next one uh, going down. Maxime had a 3D version of this. But normally um, what you want to know is, is, is look for the principal components which explains the most variance because this will then tell you um, how strong the drivers of the variation are. So in this case, actually, uh, PC1 has a huge amount of variation basically explained by this. And so when we later look at the um, load, loading plot, the loading plot, we will actually see what is driving this, this variation. So this often just gives you an estimate sort of how deep into your PCA you're going to have to look, how many PCs you're going to have to look. In this case, probably looking the first and second will be sufficient for the matching analysis. So now we know um, which components we want to look at. We can actually set up a little bit more metadata. We want to, in this case, um, visualize differences between um, individuals with and without pipe notches, so whether they're smoking or not. So us being particular about our coloring scheme, we're going to assign colors to whether they have or have not got pipe notches. And use of one of use one of Arena's fancy PCA functions to actually uh, plotting functions to actually visualize this. So if you run the next few commands, hopefully you should see a plot like this. If everyone wants that now, and you can do a thumbs up if you see such a plot. Great. Let's get some more. Just Nikolai's. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. So for Nikolai, I I have a hard time deciding what to do about this because it's a bit harder to work out whether a gene is necessarily being contributed by an ancient or a modern organism because we're not then going back and mapping all of these genes specifically and looking at the damage patterns on them. So what I have done in the past is to take the gene table and run it through decontam as if it were a taxonomic table and to clean out genes that are identified as contaminants using that method. But I don't know how appropriate that really is because it wasn't designed to be used that way. And I have not really seen anyone else addressing this issue, but it is something that that is there and needs to be worked on. So something we should make it clear is that this function analysis is all very new, also also within, sorry, so metagenomic function analysis is all very new, even in modern metagenomics. So there's a lot of even more experimental stuff going on here, I think, than so you will have to do a lot of manual work and a lot of manual reading of, of lots of different papers to get an idea of maybe what you can and can't do. We may not have the best answers here in this case. Anyway, so if everyone's got their, um, PCAs, you should already see this horseshoe effect. We also talked about, I think, in, in Maxine's um, in Maxine's talk, and we see that generally there is. Uh, are we just going to remind me what the numbers re represent again? That's the minimum number of pipe notches. Okay, that's the number of pipe notches, and then absent the presence, whether they have them or not. Mm -hmm. um, so we do see there is maybe a sort of pattern going on here, where on our PC one, in the positive. Um, axis, area of the axis, we have uh, slightly more uh, uh, pipe notches over here. But on the sort of PC2, I wouldn't say there is a clear patterning going on there. So there is a sort of separation between the groups that are going on. Um, now we want to actually ask, well, what is driving this pattern? So we based this grouping based on our uh, gene pathway tables. So for this case, we want to generate a PC biplot. 
So where we are actually going to draw on the arrow, draw basically arrows on top of the PC. Although some, often many tools will actually uh, print these plots separately, side by side. In this case, we actually plot the loadings on top of our PCA. So if you again assign some colors, run a second fancy function from Arena, and the by generate the bipod itself. You can now actually see what is causing the um, separation of our sort of two groups. In this case, it's the presence um, and absence of the pipe notches. Um, the names of the, our pathways are often very long and difficult to read, so trying to plot these would be very difficult. But at least we can now see here which ones of the top 10 loadings um, are driving this based on the gene pathway IDs. So in some cases, actually, they do a slightly descriptive. We've got the self plate, for example. Mm -hmm. So now we can say that these are the biggest drivers of the separation of the two groups, and these are the ones that we maybe most likely want to look into. So rather than having to write down each of these um, uh, IDs uh, ourselves and then having to filter our tables down to that, we can actually also do this within the table and the output of the PCA itself. So in the two commands that we have here, from the biplot object, which we generated in the previous code chunk, we can find the particular sub-object which actually has um, the greatest sort of loading information, so the furthest along our x-axis, for example, in both the forward and the negative direction, with the forward direction representing one group and the negative in the other group. So if you can run these two, And this is not in our in our code and the notebook, but I'm going to run this here so you know what this sort of looks like. I'll wrap that in the head. You can see now that we have the pathways, which PCs they are, or which sort of coordinates they have on the PCA, and whether they fall in the plus or the negative part of the that particular principle. So normally at this point, what you'd have to do externally is actually do a search of these pathway IDs to find the actual descriptive names. Irina's already done this for us. So we're going to load uh, this table. Do a little bit of cleanup and join this to our, um, no wait, not joining it yet, are we? No, okay, so this is what then our, so let's say, our pathway name database would look like, where we have the pathway names, so the human readable one, and then, oh no, so it's already loaded, sorry, Irene has already joined our, the names to the pathways, and um, so this is what we recognized before, with the path PC1, PC2 direction, that's what I showed you before, but now, in addition, we have another column, which has the pathway description. And um, of course, it's sort of while Irina says often she doesn't necessarily look at who is contributing these 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 pathways, these gene IDs. Sometimes this can be interesting, particularly when you see in the literature that there is a lot of I see debate or a lot of research into um, the different pathways being contributed by different species. Um, give an example. Well, so it, in particular, if you're looking at periodontal disease, there's a lot of of focus on specific microorganisms which are highly associated with those diseases and so we would be interested in seeing if organisms that are taxonomically associated with disease are the ones that are contributing pathways that are enriched in disease for example exactly so often if you find there is an interesting pathway then you would want to maybe go look and see if there's something driving sort of ecologically the differences there so firstly, what we will do here is look at just the, um, or take the first 10, I think, no. uh, yes, mm -hmm. take the first 10 um, driving pathways of our variation in the positive and then in the negative direction. Oh no, that's later, sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, so this is what we're doing here. Sorry. So we're doing a little bit of cleanup again. 
and then also attaching to our list of pathways the potential species which may be driving this. You ignore this error at the bottom. And so what we can see here is again the path with the name of the, there's a description of the pathway. And oh, that's the description, sorry. And then we actually have the genus and species information about what is contributing to this. We also have now, based on the, this other table, which has the original sort of alignments, the normalized value for this in the CPM column. So again, we're basically just taking multiple different outputs from human three um, and joining them together in various uh, formats. So we can see who contributes the pathway and also actually sort of the abund estimated abundance information, which has all been normalized. And given that many taxa will often duplicate sort of the functionality that they have in their genome to, for the pathway, we often will see which is more dominantly contributing this in our particular samples. And so for this, we can use this um, CPM value to basically find which is the most dominant species. So what is the percent of the copies per million for the pathway? Um, sorry, yeah, the percent can be then used to filter, let's say, the ones which give the most dominant uh, fraction of that pathway contribution. So we do this here by calculating the percent. And you can see, actually, there's an example. We're having to do a lot of calculations ourselves. There are not necessarily tools which produce this for you. You have to explore the data quite manually for this current sort of state of, of, the, of the functional aspects of metagenomics and ancient metagenomics. Um, filter down to PC1 in the positive direction. And again, now attach this back onto our other uh, data. So is everyone keeping up to date now? So we should be up to line 507. Wait a little bit longer for everyone else to catch up. This is a little bit tedious. This is normal uh, when you have to explore sort of data where there isn't sort of preconceived sort of tutorials and workshops. Are there any questions at the moment? I would also recommend, or we would recommend probably going through the step by step yourself. Uh, and reading through exactly what you're doing with the manipulations. We're, we're skimming over a lot of this because it is very basic sort of table manipulation, which is maybe not. Okay, there's no more thumbs up, but so I'll carry on. So now we have our pathways, the pathway descriptions. We have a um, percentage of, uh, or rather we know which is the dominant tax contributing that pathway. We can actually also now look at who is contributing to these top 10 pathways that drive the separation along uh, PC1. So we can do this as a bar chart. And so what we're essentially doing there is taking this table, cleaning up a little bit um, the data format, so to converting, for example, the species into factors. We're also doing here the filtering to the top 10%, and then running a ggplot command Again, a very custom one. And you should see some form of plot like this, which we'll see a bigger, a slightly bigger one in a bit. But what you can ascend, what you should be able to see is that for each pathway, probably going like this from most, uh, the one that's driving the most variation, the least variation, if there is actually taxonomic information to which species is contributing the pathway, you can actually see the fraction of these along in these in the bar chart. Does that make sense? Or should I explain it again? I'm seeing nodding for people with webcams on. Yeah. Okay, one thumbs up, but I'll. Uh, yeah, a few more. I'll catch it. Yes, then. So I would jump in here and say it's important to note what the difference is between a gray bar and an empty bar. So a gray bar means that there was no species-specific entry. Everything is listed as unclassified for that gene. So it was not able to attribute it to any particular species just to say that it is present. And the bar that's empty, so PWY5345, means that it couldn't actually assign anything at a species or an unclassified level because of the way that it does its internal normalization. It's just able to say that we did pick it up, but we couldn't break it down further. 
So it's present, but we don't know who's contributing it or where it's coming from. Okay. And we can do the same thing again, but for the negative loadings. So the other group. And you can ignore, ignore the warning. I'm just do basically the same thing as we did before, step by step in one block. And you should end up with the same uh, bar plot, but this time on the other direction, so on the left hand side of the PCA we saw earlier. Has everyone been able to generate this? Machine yes. Great. And finally, I really like to join these together. She made many of these in the paper from last year. And in this case, in the last command, I'm hoping this is going to open in a different window the PDF plot of all of the plots together. Hey. Well, hey, it works. So hopefully, you should see something like this. Has everyone got that? Yeah. So essentially, this is just everything stuck together, but in a way that's actually much more easier for you to sort of cross compare uh, all the information. So what you can do here is basically say, well, now I can visualize my two groups again based on the metadata that we have. So the individuals with presumably no or a little um, pipe notches versus those that I do. And we can cross, sorry, other way around. Actually, an important point here is with this paper is that you do not necessarily get the associations that you expect to see. So in the PCA, there's a complete mixing of individuals with and without pipe notches. So this was a very unexpected finding. And this is what it is. You're not always going to see what you expect based on what we know in modern individuals. And you should not try to fight it and force it to fit what you think it should be. If you get a, well, there's no pattern there result, that in itself is interesting and is worth looking into. If, if dental pathology is not apparently what is shaping the oral microbiome in these individuals, you have to look deeper and see, well, can we figure out what it is? And so that's actually one reason that you may look into functional profiling because you don't see any patterns that you expect to see. Taxonomy doesn't tell you very much, but maybe it's not the taxonomy that matters. Maybe there's functional differences in these that are, are related to something that we haven't measured in the pathology. And you may be able to pick up on that by looking at the gene content or the pathway content. And certainly what we're finding is in our group, in many cases, the taxonomy doesn't tell us much. Um, it's rather more the functional stuff, but it is adding a whole layer of complexity. It's not just the genomes, you're having sort of individual genes within each genome that you're finding, um, so it's a bit tricky. But anyway, even if there isn't this grouping that I sort of inferred, probably there's something else going on in the deeper PCs, and um, you can at least, hopefully, assuming you had the clear separation here, then say, well, okay, or this pathway on the negative loading, so 7.6, which is this one, we can say, well, nothing, that's a bad example, but you can also see in one plot, sort of this pathway is driving this part of metadata, indicating this pathway is important, and then also saying, okay, well, this particular species or group of species is maybe driving that, that variation as well. So I think that is the end of the notebook now. Add a couple of slides to yeah. the end. So we will go back to the slides now, and that. So. Yeah. so functional analysis is probably the most time-consumingly difficult part of metagenome analysis because the way to interpret this is to go into the literature and read about those pathways and to find out what they do and what is known about them and why they might be worth investigating further. So it's unfortunately not a quick, easy answer, but you will hopefully make a lot more insightful discoveries of your data set by taking this approach because it can tell you a lot more specifically than taxonomy because taxonomy actually hides a lot of very specific functional differences. So yeah, not easy, but that's, you know, you got to put in work to get cool answers, so go for it. You are coming to the cutting edge, really, in many yeah. ways, of this sort of analysis. And there's a lot of unknowns uh, in this area, but indeed, you get the more exciting stories from it, I think. Is the best way to say. Mm -hmm.
So, what time are we at? Oh, okay. So we've got 20 minutes. Are there any questions? Yeah, did I speak too fast? And would anyone like me to go back and go over anything again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a naive question. You absolutely don't know this. And, and no, so that's actually a very important point. Just because you can detect that the genes are there and maybe they're enriched versus in one group of samples versus another sample, doesn't mean that those genes are expressed. If you want to know that, you actually have to do proteomics and metabolomics. Proteomics to see whether or not you get the gene itself of a protein. Metabolomics to see whether or not you're getting the functional aspect of that protein, whether that protein is actually active. So if you're getting the, the enzymes or the, the metabolites that are produced by the action of that protein. So that is actually what would be the most informative to look at, but it's also unfortunately really difficult because prote metaproteomics and metametabolomics are really, really new and they're very, very not easy to do at this point because they're so new and the databases are, are really limited because you actually need to have individual proteins um, structurally sequenced or at least the sequence of the protein well documented. You need to know what kind of uh, modifications are made to the proteins so that you could expect it shifts in the, the spectra that you get from running it through the mass spectrometer. You need to know exactly the structure of the metabolites that are produced by the actions of that protein, if it's a, an enzyme or something. And in many cases, we don't have that information because it's just, there, you know, there's millions of metabolites and people just haven't got around to, to structural characterization of whatever it is. So it's actually really, really, that is what we would really, really like to get, but we are unfortunately very far from being able to easily do that. So we use this as a proxy to infer what's actually being expressed and what's actually active, but it's by no means accurate.